Good to have some good music today, We're lifting up the name of the name of our God and being able to focus in on Him because that's what I'd like to I'd like to really continue to do that um, even as I uh, speak with you this morning and, and open up God's Word. Got some things that I'd like to tell you about God Himself. I want to start by by uh, by celebrating something that's coming up. Those of you who uh, how, many, how many of y'all have been to a movie in the past in the past year? How many of y'all have been to the movie theater in the past year? Okay, a lot, lot of folks in this room, not everybody, but a lot of folks been in here. Um, I, if you are an action movie kind of guy, or girl, okay, I know, all right? If you like action movies, you're kind of excited about, uh, about April of 2020. April of next year, they have set to release the 25th James Bond movie. James Bond, 25 25 movies. That's a lot. And uh, of course, as they've gone along, as they've progressed and, and evolved, they've gotten a little bit more action-packed and those kind of things, trying to keep up with the times, kind of what they do. But, uh, but there are, you know, James Bond is a, it's just a universal, if you're into movies, it's just a universal symbol kind of guy of, of movies. And of course, there are a lot of, a lot of famous lines that come out of that movie, uh, those series of movies. Of course, the most famous would be you know, I'm not going to try to do the accent or any of that kind of stuff. I'm just a southern guy, you know, but he, if, if he was southern, he'd say, my name Bond, James Bond, you know, but he's, he is what he is. I know he's got a, you know, a much sexier voice than mine or whatever, but, uh, but that's the most famous. But then there are a few other lines in the movies that are, that are pretty famous, and one of them is the way that he likes his martinis. Now, I, I am, I'm not an alcohol kind of guy. I'm, I'm an abstinence-only kind of guy when it comes to alcohol, and I... I, uh, and, and I will preach on that for too long and make most of you mad at me, all right? I'm going to do that. But, uh, so I'm not pushing that. I'm just saying it's a line in the movie. And how does he like, how does he like his martinis? Come on. Shaken, not stirred. Now, the people who, who are into martinis, n- nobody in here told me this, okay? But I read it online anyway that that's really the opposite of how it's supposed to be. I don't know. I don't really care. But shaken, not stirred. But I'll just tell you, that's really not realistic to life, and I don't mean about drinking alcohol. I mean when it comes to life and the circumstances that life throws at us, a lot of times we are quite shaken. I remember when I was going through some of the, some of the most difficult times in my life, the most difficult, difficult times in my faith, I remember attending a church, and in that church they kept singing a song. It, it came up, and this church doesn't sing songs over and over and over again, but it just seems like every other Sunday there was a song that talked about not being shaken. And I remember thinking, that ain't me, man, because I am shaken right now. Well, what does it take to not be shaken by the, all the action-packed things that come our way in life? So we're really going to kick off a... Uh, I really want to find out what the Bible has to say about that, and we're going to kick off a series called Stirred, Not Shaken. We're going to be stirred in our walk with God. We're going to be stirred in our faith without being shaken in our faith. In fact, I guess the tagline along with this should have been, I should have put it on, online, I mean on, the, on PowerPoint, don't know why I didn't, but the, the tagline would be how, how to keep uh, keeping the faith in a messed up world. Do you agree we're kind of in a messed up world right now? I mean, things might be going your way, I'm not, and, and I'm glad about that. I mean, things are going my way. I'm, I'm happy. It's not that I'm unhappy, but I just know that we just live in a messed up world, and sometimes, sometimes that is evidenced in things that we, that we have no control over. I mean, for instance, we do have, we've got what is now a Category 5 hurricane that we don't know where it's going to go in the next few days. We don't know where it's going to hit. It could hit us directly. We're in, that, uh, we're in that cone of uncertainty that they like to call it. It could come and it could, it could I mean, it could wipe out your house. It could, it could flood all of your stuff. I mean, there are just some things that are just out of control. It's part of the fallen universe that you and I live in. And so sometimes that messed up world is evidenced in, in things that we just have no control over. Sometimes it's, it's the circumstances that we find ourselves in. It might be something that happened in a relationship or something that happened at work or something that happened with your health. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff. 
We talked about that this morning in Sunday school, the, just the difficulties that, that were faced and, and, and the, the, the mom who, who lost a child and didn't know if that child, I mean, she didn't know what Elijah was going to do. She didn't know that Elijah was going to raise her child from the dead. She just knew that her child was dead. There are just some difficulties that we face, circumstances that we go through, and it was a reminder of, to us that we live in a messed up world. Sometimes I, sometimes I can't help but think, I don't have all the answers as to why bad things happen in this world, but I know that one of the reasons is, and this isn't a comprehensive reason, one of the reasons is to remind us that we ain't home yet. This is not heaven. And until we reach there, we live in a messed up world. How do we keep the faith in the midst of all that? Well, Peter, the Apostle Peter, you've heard of him. Uh, if you've been in church, you've heard of Peter. Peter wrote, he wrote a couple of letters, and some of those letters are really very helpful in showing a believer how to keep the faith in a messed up world. And so we're going to start a, in a study of First Peter. And as I was, as I was kind of doing an overview study of, of the book of First Peter uh, and thinking about the time that we have available to us until we hit the, hit the, uh, the holidays and all that's coming up, as I was looking at that, I was thinking, that's really not enough time. I mean, we have a certain number of Sundays between now and Thanksgiving, and there's, I mean, the book is so packed full of great, great meat for our spiritual lives. I just felt like we just didn't have time. We're going to be covering this not just on Sunday mornings. We're also going to take some of the things that we're going to kind of gloss over on Sunday morning, and we're going to look at those at a little bit more depth on Sunday evening. So I would invite you to come back and try to make it a point to be here on Sunday evenings as well. But we're going to be talking about how to keep the faith in a messed up world. And today, I want to talk to you about the God of our salvation. I'm, I'm excited to, to have seen that we were singing so much about God and His name and what He means for us, especially in the area of our salvation, because I want to talk to you today about the God of our salvation. So I hope that you'll turn to your Bibles with me, First Peter chapter 1. We're going to start at chapter 1, cover the first 12 verses this morning. Take out that outline that you have, that, uh, that growth guide that, you, that was provided for you in your, in your uh, bulletin. Maybe take out a pen or pencil and write down a few notes that hopefully that will help you. I believe that what I'm going to share with you today is some of the most important things that I could share with you anywhere, anytime, covering any particular subject. And I think what we're going to find today is that when we, when we think about contemplate, meditate on God's plan and God's work in our lives, it gives us strength. It gives us strength for the hour. It gives us strength for difficulties. And it keeps us grounded in a messed up world. But it really is going to begin with God and the salvation that he provides to us, that he provides for us. And so, Really, our thoughts today aren't necessarily on the messed up world part. That's coming. Peter is going to get there. That's one of the things that he's going to talk a lot about because I'm telling you, the people that he was writing to when he wrote First Peter, they really understood what it was like to be in a messed up world. Their lives were a train wreck, not because of anything that they had done except for following God. It was what people were doing to them because they were following God. But they knew full well they were in a messed up world. And so Peter is going to begin to talk about salvation. That is what chapter 1 is going to really, really hone in on. And so if we're going to be faithful, we're going to be faithful to the Scriptures, and if I'm going to be faithful to you in talking about a messed up world, I don't know it better than Peter does. Peter, especially being guided by the Holy Spirit, I can't say it better than he does. And so we're going to talk about the God of our salvation. First Peter chapter 1, look at... Look at, how he, look at how he begins. Verse 1, we're just going to read through the first 12 verses to set the stage this morning. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout, and he gives different regions uh, that were all around the Roman Empire at this time, and the people had been scattered to these different regions. He says, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours to the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though you now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. In other words, you live in a messed up world. You and I both, both know that. So that the proof, proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace would come to, would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Man, we have the great story of God and the salvation that he has brought and made available to you and to me. Many of you in here have received that salvation. Many of you are sitting in here and you will be able to rejoice in that. I hope that others who are sitting in here will be challenged to consider receiving that salvation that God has made available. So let's get right into it. What are we going to find out about God and the God of our salvation? First of all, I want you to understand that God is the provider of our salvation. He is the provider. He is the one who makes it available to you and to me. And apart from from God, you and I have no hope of ever being saved. And I don't mean that he just did what the actions that are necessary. I mean God has really pursued you in salvation. And when we, the great thing that Peter has done for us is he's given us what I, I hate to tell you is a very deep doctrinal truth concerning God and our salvation. Now, when I mention the word doctrinal, some of y'all just flipped off automatically. Boop, don't have time for that. Let me just tell you, let me tell you how great God is about our salvation. Just a few words about God and our salvation. Notice in here, in these, in the, just really at the get-go of his addressing them, he says that you are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. First of all, you need to understand that God the Father selected you. If you are saved in here, God the Father selected you. It says here that you are chosen by him. Now this makes some people uncomfortable. And I'm not really sure why. I think it's where people have have taken this thought and they, uh, they have said some, they have taken this idea of being chosen and they've run in some weird directions and people have taken exception to that and, and these, there's all these kind of battles that are going back and forth. Listen, I don't, have any battles to, I don't have any battles to wage in here. I simply want to tell you that before you chose God, God chose you. Understand that very clearly. And in case, we're, in case we're not clear on that, I want to read a few passages of Scripture, and I'll let you wrestle with these. I'll call out the reference. It's not going to be in here. It's not on your outline, but I would encourage you to write this down. Uh, I believe it will be an encouragement to many of you. John chapter 15 and verse 16. Jesus began this, this, uh, this discussion by saying, You did not choose me, but I chose you. A few verses later in John chapter 15 and verse 19, he said, You are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. John chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus said, I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. Mark chapter 13 and verse 20. Jesus is talking about the end times, and he says this, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose... He shortened the days. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul continues this idea and he says, So as those who have been chosen of God 
holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And again, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, He chose us, meaning God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. He said, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And then we'll come back around to 1 Peter chapter 2. We read it already in verse 2. Uh, well, I guess verses 1 and 2. But again, he's going to address that in verse 9. He says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Before you take my words and run with them and go in some direction that I'm not going, let me just tell you, I am telling you one thing and one thing only. Before you chose God, He chose you. He selected you. Now, let me tell you why that's good news. The reason that's good news is, is I want you to think about, we have the, the modern day practice of adoption. Somebody walks in, they see, uh, they see some kids maybe in an orphanage or something like that, and their heart really connects with a particular individual in that room, and they say, I choose that one. I remember seeing the, uh, the testimony of, uh, of Ronald Reagan's son that he had adopted. And he was talking about how, how blessed and how thankful he was because he said, you know, my, my, my brothers and my sisters, they really didn't have a choice as to who their parents was. Their parents didn't really have a choice of who the kids were. But man, when they saw me, they chose me. It just made him feel that special. Let me tell you something. You are, if you're saved today, you are that special. God looked down at you and he says, I choose you. It's really a beautiful picture. God, the Father, selects you. Second thing, if you're saved, God, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son, saves you. God, the Father, selects you. God, the Son, saves you. He spilled his blood, the Bible says. And of course, not just here, but all over. We see it all over the New Testament. God, the Son, saves you through his blood that he poured out on your behalf. But then, God, the Holy Spirit, sanctifies you. It says, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the God, the Spirit, sanctifies you. This is a, this is a process that is ongoing. And, and it's, it's a process that He's working in your life. He is actively engaged in your life. Now, if you ever, uh, if you ever come up to me and uh, you, like the, you like the shirt I have on, or maybe you like my tie this morning, or you like my suit or my shoes or whatever, if you like what I got on, it's probably because my wife picked it out. I mean, that's just, that's just a matter of fact. If you look at me and you're like, I don't, I don't like that shirt too much, you know, his clothes don't match or whatever, it's probably because I picked it out, all right? Let's just get that over with. It's my fault, all right? You like what I got? My wife. Now, let me just tell you, if we're getting ready for something important, you know, we're getting, we're, you know, I've come in from the yard, and I'm looking a big mess, and, and we're getting ready to go to, uh, uh, to something that's pretty important. I'll go to my wife and be like, so baby, uh, what, what do I need to wear tonight? Just, just tell me what to wear. And she'll say, well, why don't you wear these pants and this shirt? And I'm like, okay. And then I'll go, and of course, I'll put on the wrong shoes. Why don't you, why don't you change shoes and put the shoes on? And why, don't you, why don't you clean? And, and I just want you to imagine... If, if somebody came along and they had just come out of the yard and, and they're looking all nasty and dirty and they stink and they don't have on the right clothes and, 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 and the, the wife comes together because, you know, the wife is the one who has the taste, right? And so she, you know, she cleans him up, cleans up his hair, and does his hair for him and, and uh, gets his clothes together and irons those clothes and, and, uh, and picks them out for him and, and all that. And all of a sudden, he went from being this, this gross person who just came out of the yard and all of a sudden he's looking like a prince. Not that I've ever looked like a prince, but you know what I mean. All of a sudden, he's looking like a prince. The transformation from this to this, all because of the work of the wife. In, in some sense of the manner, that's kind of what the Holy Spirit is doing. The, 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 the Son, God the Son comes and He saves and, and, and uh, uh, He gives Him a new life. And the Holy Spirit comes in and says, hey, let's, let's fix that hair. Let, let, let's, let's clean up a little bit. Let's smell a little bit. Let's, let's, let's put on some nicer clothes. Let's get your, let's get your beard trimmed up. And now you will be made ready 
for this most important occasion, which is meeting God face to face. The Holy Spirit comes in and makes a transformation in our lives. That's what sanctification is all about. Taking us from something that was dingy to something that is beautiful and presentable to God the Father. You see, all this is going on by the work of God in your life and in my life when it comes to salvation. So that it's no wonder that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul is going to say, he's, he, you see the passage is, is behind me and in your outline, he says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this, what is the antecedent to faith, uh, to, to this, that is faith. And this, this faith is not of yourselves. It true is a gift of God. You couldn't have... You couldn't have been selected without God. You couldn't have been saved without God. You couldn't have been sanctified without God. You could not even have responded to God's offer without God. That's why it is called God's gift. He has been so fabulous in offering you salvation. And if there is any tug in your heart, about coming to receive him in faith and salvation, to receive him as your Savior and as your Lord. That is the work of God in you, and your maker is calling you to himself. Don't ignore that. Receive him today, because he is the God of salvation. He is the provider of your salvation. Second thing we see. In this passage, we see that God is the protector of, of our salvation. Notice, notice in this passage he says um, in, verse, uh, in verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. Not only that, but verse 5 continues that we are protected by the power of God. If you're saved... You know that you don't have to get resaved. It doesn't work like that. If you're truly saved, you are not going to lose that salvation because it is, it is undefiled. It will not fade away. You are protected by the power of God. That word, that word power there in the, in, at, at least I'm, I'm protected in, the, at least in my translation, the word protected is from the Greek word praureo. And it is the noun form of that word is translated as a guard. God is guarding that salvation. And so let me just tell you, let me just tell you, the only thing, you ready for this? This is very important if you, if you read this passage. The only thing that could take your salvation away, all right? Hope I got your attention now. The only thing that could take your salvation away is that which is stronger than the power of God. If you can take God out, if Satan can take God out, if your sin can take God out, if it's more powerful than God, yep, your salvation is in bad, bad trouble. But if God is stronger than anything that can be thrown at him, and he is, your salvation is secure. He is the protector of your salvation. And that's, he, even Jesus reiterated that in John chapter 10. I give them eternal life so that they will never be lost. Underline the word, if you're taking notes, underline the word, never. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father gave them to me and he is greater than all others. No one can snatch them from his hands. Only that which is more powerful will overcome. If God is more powerful, you are secure. Man, we could preach a whole message on that, but for the sake of time this morning, we will move on. God is the provider of our salvation. He is the protector of our, protector of our salvation. Understand in, ver in the, next, uh, the next line, God is the point of our salvation. It is, he is the point. I want you to look at verse 7. He says you're going to overcome all these distresses, all these trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, listen to this, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you know 
And this, this is going to be a shock. Oh, this is going to be a shock to the American system, to the American mind. You ready for this? You are not ultimately the point of your salvation. Your salvation ultimately isn't about you. It's about Jesus. It's about him. It's so that when people look at you and they see what has happened in your life, both here and when we get to heaven and they see where, where you were and where God took you to, they're going to say, praise God. What has he done in that person's life? It's really going to be about God. Ultimately, everything should point to him. Now, we get the benefits. We get the blessings of being a part of that. I like to liken it as, uh, you know, we're, we're almost at the end of summer. Do you know something I haven't had all summer? I am deeply, deeply disappointed. I have had not one spoonful of homemade ice cream. There is something wrong with that. Summer has come and gone. No homemade ice cream. We don't have one of the little churn thingies at our house, so I can't do it, all right? I have never made homemade ice cream in all my life. I just go get some, some, uh, some briars or Mayfield moose tracks or whatever the case may be. I, I don't know how to make, but, but somebody, somebody here should have compassion on the preacher and make him some homemade ice cream. That's all I'm saying, all right? Now, don't put any of them fruits and all that kind of stuff in there. Just vanilla and chocolate. We're good, all right? But I haven't had any. So let's just imagine that we had here in, in uh, you know, so that the preacher will stop talking about it, we have a, uh, a homemade ice cream contest. And whoever is good at it will come over here and they will make some homemade ice cream. We'll have it right over here in the fellowship hall. Sounds like a good fellowship to me. I don't know. I'd, maybe the deacons ought to get this together. I don't know. So we have a homemade ice cream contest and we get in there and y'all make all this homemade ice cream. And, and I, I, I just, as the preacher, as the one who's just a servant of the people, I will be the taste tester, Okay. Just because I love y'all. That's, that's the only reason. And so I get to taste everybody's homemade ice cream. And oh, man, it just, it's just delicious. And finally, we'll come across the winner. And I don't know who the winner is because I don't know who makes homemade ice cream in here because nobody's made it for me all summer. So I don't really know who would be the winner. But let's just say that I get to sit under the winter and I get to have the first bowl of ice cream. Man, I am benefiting from this. This is a blessing to my soul. But the point of the whole thing, the point of the whole thing wasn't that Lane gets to enjoy ice cream. The point of the whole thing was because the winner wanted to prove that he or she was the best ice cream maker. Now, Jesus, Jesus comes and he saves you and me. And we get the benefit and we get the blessings of that salvation. But the ultimate point of the whole deal was to look at Jesus and say, wow, what a great, great Savior. He is the point of your salvation. He is the whole reason, the glory and honor, the ultimate glory and honor of Jesus Christ on this earth and in the life to come is really the reason you're saved. He is the point of salvation. So, not only is he the provider of salvation and the protector of salvation and the point of salvation, but finally, God is the pronouncer of salvation. That's what verses 10 through 12, that's what it's talking about. He sent prophets from long ago to say this is what is coming. The Spirit of Christ had indwelled them, even in the Old Testament times, they had been indwelled by the Spirit, and they had been called to pronounce, here is the coming of the Messiah. And sure enough, just like he said through them, that's exactly how it came to be. Now, the reason that this is important in this passage, the reason that, that Peter felt it necessary to bring this out, it was included to make sure that we knew that this was God's plan from the beginning. Let, let me tell you something. God, God, God didn't form this earth and then sit down one day and look and kind of watch. And you know, I, I told Adam and Eve to do this, and uh, they've kind of messed up. Now let's see. I've got to go with plan B. Did you know that Jesus Christ was not plan B. He was plan A, he was plan only, and it will always be that way. From the beginning. 
God planned this from the beginning, and he is going to bring it about. So, because the reason, and here's what's, here's what's in, your, in your outline there, what God plans, God performs. He is the pronouncer of our salvation. And he just wants everybody to notice. I want you to know, I told you so. This is how I said it was going to be from the beginning. This is how it's come to be. You need to understand, I've been behind this this whole time. Make sure nobody else gets credit but me and me alone because I'm the only one who deserves it. That's what God is telling us. Now, God is all about our salvation. He is all in it. He's all through it. He was before it. He was during it. He'll be after it. He is all about our salvation. Without God, there ain't no hope. None. Now, that brings us back to We live in a messed up world. Where on earth, how does all this fit into a messed up world? Let me just share a few thoughts, just a few closing thoughts. They're there in your outline. And then we'll be finished. But I believe this is is the beginning. This is the beginning of how to deal with a messed up world, how to keep the faith in a messed up world. There are three things that I believe is very important for us to know. First is this. God is vitally interested in you. He is very interested in you. He has not forsaken you. He has not forgotten about you. He has not abandoned you. God said he would never leave you or forsake you, and he is holding true to that. I don't know what it is that you might be dealing with. I don't know how difficult things might be for you right now. They might be on the scale of 1 to 10. They might be very difficult. They might not be difficult at all. But I want you to know God is vitally interested in you. In you. Look at what he said about his own people in the book of Exodus. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I am aware of their sufferings. That is good, good news. Second thing I believe that this, this passage, these first 12 verses in our salvation should tell us is that God is continually active in your life. He's not just taking a step back. He didn't just wind up the clock and let it go. He is continually active in your life. I like how New Century Version uh, translates Philippians 1.6. God began doing a good work in you. That's that salvation that he brought to you. And he will continue it until until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. I am sure of that. He is active in your life. And then third and finally, our ability to thrive in a messed up world hinges not just on our salvation. That is where it begins, but it hinges not just on our salvation, but if we're going to thrive, it also hinges on how central that salvation is to our lives. How central it is to our lives. In other words, it's not just something that's been added to your life. It's not like, well, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm saved, that's good, but, uh, but man, you don't understand the problems that I've got out here. Uh-uh. It is central to your life. Now, I know you're finished taking down the blanks, I know that. That's all the blanks that are in there. But I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Because I I believe this is, again, I don't think, I just don't believe I can improve upon what God's Word tells us. And so trying to be faithful to what Peter has done here, I want you to hear this. Peter knew, okay, mark this down. Peter knew when he began to write these, these words, when he began to write this letter, he knew the messed up world that his readers were living in. He knew how how devastating this messed up world was to the people that he was writing to. Not only that, but we haven't gotten there in here today, but just trust me, go through and read the whole book, you'll see what I'm talking about. Not only that, Peter knew that it was going to get worse. And history proves that it did get worse. And so... It's interesting then for me, if we're trying to figure out, well, how are we going to live in a messed up world, and he's dealing with people who are in a messed up world, where did Peter begin? Did he begin by saying, well, look, I, just, you know, I just want to comfort you, and I just want to tell you how sorry I am, and I know that you're going through this, this, and this, and I know that the world is all messed up. And did he, he didn't start with James Bond. He didn't start with all that. He dove straight in. He said, he said, the one thing that we got to work out first, the thing that we need to address the most, what is going to keep us grounded and what is going to give us a foundation for whatever it is we deal with in life, 
If we are going to thrive in this in a messed up world, we must talk about our salvation. So what, what has to happen is not only, well, the first thing, the first thing is, is we, have to, we have to examine ourselves and make sure that we are of the faith. And so I ask you, are you saved? Has there been a time in your life where you received Jesus Christ, repented of your sins, asked him to come into your life and save you from your sins? The first thing that you have to ask yourself if you're going to deal in this messed up world with any kind of success, are you saved? And if you're not saved, in a few moments we're going to have an invitation and you can come and be saved or at least find out a little bit more about what that means. That's fine. If you just want to ask questions, we're good with that. I'll help you. I'll help walk down that road with you. The first thing you've got to ask is, is there, are you saved? But then the second thing you've got to ask is, how, and this is, this is very important for, for most people, because most people in here are at least going to answer the question, yes, I'm saved. Now, whether or not you really are, that's between you and God, I don't know. But most people in here are going to say, yeah, I'm saved. So really, what you've got to ask is, how central is your salvation to your life? Is that the guiding principle in your life? Is that the guiding the guiding part of your life or all your decisions made based upon something else? How you're going to get, get further in your career or how you're going to get more money or how you're going to get more friends or whatever. What is, it, what is it that is driving you? And until that salvation not just is, is secured but is central to your life, you are prone to be swept away by the, by the sands of this life. Christ is the only rock that you have. So if you're going to deal in a messed up world, are you saved? And is that salvation central to your life? During our time of invitation, if you're not saved, I want you to, I want you to come down and let's at least talk about that. Let's at least begin the conversation. Can we do that? Others of you, listen, if it's not central in your life, you're welcome to come down and talk with me. That's fine. But it might just be just as, as, uh, as critical for you or as helpful for you just to come pray here at the altar, pray there in your seat. Maybe there's somebody that you know that is really, I mean, they're really going through the ringer right now. And they, you, you just need to come and pray for their salvation. The altar will be open for that as well. Also, during that time of invitation, if you want to come and join our church, then we'd be, uh, be glad to, t to talk about that. If there's anything that I, as pastor, can help you out with that, I'll be standing down front. God, we thank you for the salvation that you, that you offer and how, how uh, active you are in that, how vital you are in that, how necessary you are in our salvation. So that you created us, we sin against you, and yet you actively pursue us. God, how great of a God you are. Lord, you know that, that doesn't, uh, our salvation doesn't really make it life any easier. Um, it wasn't any easier on you when you walked, uh, when you walked in this, on this earth. So you know it doesn't make life easier, but Lord, we, uh, we need guidance. We need you to make it through this messed up world. I pray especially for those who don't know you. They're, they can't call you their father. They are not your child, because they have never received Jesus Christ. I pray that they would recognize their need for you this morning, this very moment, and that they would surrender themselves to you or at least begin that journey toward you. God, for those who are saved, may they evaluate how much does that salvation really matter to me? How much does it drive me in my daily decisions? And may you become one in all and through all and first in all, have your own way in the next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand together.